thanks for coming to my talk. I'm going to speak about average case depth hierarchy theorem for Boolean circuits. This is joint work with Ben Rossman and Rocco Servideo. So this is a, very briefly, this is a talk in circuit complexity. Just to quickly recall, the goal here is that we want strong lower bounds on the size of circuits computing an explicit function. Uh, what do we mean by circuits? The holy grail here is to understand the class of polynomial size and or not circuits, or so-called p slash poly. But we are still very far from understanding this class. This would separate p from np. So the focus of research so far, and of course of this talk, is on restricted subclasses of p slash poly. And we're going to focus on one restricted subclass, the class of small depth Boolean circuits. So this is the model for computation. Uh, we work with n or and not gates. We can assume that negations are at the bottom, although that's not very important. So we want explicit functions uh, such that any such circuit uh, is complex. What do I mean by complex? There are two measures. One is depth, which is just the number of layers. Here are three. And size is just the number of gates. Okay? And in this talk, we are focusing on small depth Boolean circuits. So let's think of depth as a constant, uh, say 100, or you know, a slow growing function of n. But the goal here is we want very strong lower bounds. Uh, we want exponential lower bounds on size. OK, good. So the outline of this talk is going to take some time to get, out, get to our main result. Uh, there's quite a bit of context, but I just want to quickly recall uh, something that I'm sure we all know, the, 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 the signature result here on parity versus small depth circuits. A uh, long, long line of work um, ending up with Hastad's optimal lower bounds for parity. And there are two extensions, uh, the first of which is also very well known, uh, average case hardness, and the second of which may be slightly less well known, uh, but a depth hierarchy theorem for Boolean circuits. I'll explain what all of these mean. OK, so this is all context. And hopefully, I'll get to my, our main result, uh, which is that we achieve both extensions simultaneously. So as the title suggests, we prove an average case depth hierarchy theorem. Uh, I'd like to speak about our technique, uh, which is that of random projections, uh, generalization of random restrictions, which allow us to get, get across some of the difficulties that, that people face in uh, establishing this. And then at the very end, just very quickly in one slide, I'd like to talk about two subsequent applications of random projections that I'm happy to talk about offline. OK, let's start with the first bullet, just quickly recalling uh, this well-known result. So parity versus small depth circuits, we have exponential lower bounds against constant depth circuits computing a very explicit function, a parity of x1 to xn. So it doesn't get more explicit than this. So in particular, building on a long line of work, uh, Hasta showed in his thesis that for every depth d greater than 2, say d equals 100, depth d circuits computing the n variable parity function require large size, 2 to the n to the 1 over d minus 1. So if you allow me to build a depth 100 circuit, uh, to compute the parity function, I need to have size 2 to the n to the 0 0.99. What? Yeah. So very strong lower bound against a very explicit function. OK, good. So this is parity versus small depth circuits. Let's move on quickly to two extensions, the first of which, again, is fairly well known. Average case hardness. So in fact, uh, you need exponential size not just to compute parity, but in fact to even approximate parity. So in the same thesis, he showed the following strengthening of what I just showed. For every depth d greater than 2, depth d circuits of roughly the same size, 2 to the n to the 1 over d, they, they not only can they not compute parity, but the agreement with parity is half plus exponentially small in n. Exp exponentially small when d is a constant. OK, so not only can you not get 100% accuracy, you cannot even get 51%. OK, so very briefly, just the constant 1 function, uh, the most boring circuit, achieves 50% accuracy. Uh, and Hastad's extension says, you know, if you allow me to build a depth 100 circuit, you allow me what seems like very large size, 2 to the n to the 1 over 99. I cannot do much 50%. Uh, I cannot do 51%. OK, average case hardness. Let's talk about the next extension, the depth hierarchy theorem, which is going to take slightly more time. But very briefly, just to recall, uh, hopefully standard notation, AC0 sub D is a set, it's a class of depth D poly n size circuits. So AC0 is just a union of all D, constant D. OK, here's a cartoon version of Hastad's theorem. Uh, it says that parity, which I'm going to denote by the red dot, uh, doesn't leave, live in the green circle, AC0. Uh, so first, sex and sip first showed that the red dot doesn't live in a green circle, and subsequent work pushed it higher and higher up, further and further away from the green circle. And now we know that parity requires depth roughly log n over log log n, if you want, com if you want polynomial size circuits. OK, good. So this is one thing that Hassad's theorem says. Another th thing that it says is that if you force me to use depth d, uh, not only do I, am I not able to compute it in polynomial size, I need exponential size. OK, so here's a challenge. I want the same exponential lower bound against depth D circuits. 
ideally 2 to the n to the 1 over d. Uh, but not against parity, but against a hard function that lives in depth d plus 1 ac0. So simple enough that if you allow me depth d plus 1, I can compute it in poly size. But if you force me to use depth d, I get the same lower bound as I get for parity. OK, so hopefully intuitively, I'll talk more about this, but intuitively, this is a more delicate task. I want a stronger lower bound, oh, sorry. I want as strong a lower bound against the same class of, of circuits, but against a hard function that is a lot simpler. OK, uh, and this is also already known. This is also in the same thesis. How's that show that for every depth d greater than 2, uh, there's a function fd plus 1, the so-called Sipser function, which I'll tell you about, such that what fd plus 1 uh, is simple, unlike parity, is simple enough to live in depth d plus 1 ac0. But just like parity, any depth d circuit for the d plus first Sipser function requires size 2 to the n to the 1 over d. So just to recall, this is the same lower bound we get for parity. OK, so this improves on Sipser, who first showed a super polynomial separation uh, for the Sipser function. This was improved to exponential, but not such a strong exponential bound by Yao. And a hard function for all of the above is the Sipser function, which I'll tell you about. OK, but is this clear so far? OK, and the name, it, it establishes a depth hierarchy theorem, showing that depth d plus 1 is much more powerful than depth d. Right? OK, good. So what's the depth d subsurf function? Uh, the formal definition is that it's a depth d, read once, regular, alternating, modern formula. But hopefully, the picture says it all. Um, it's basically the first formula you would write down if you had to write down the depth d formula. Alternating layers of ORs and ANDs gates, fan in regular, n to the 1 over d, so the product is n. It's read once, so everything is touched only once. It's monotone, there are no negations. OK? So it's. OK, so that's the depth d Sipser function. So we, we should think of this as like the parity of the depth hierarchy theorems. It's really the right function to look at. And I'd like to give you some intuition as to why, why it's the right function to look at. So, so here's the intuition. We have the depth 3 Sipser function, or n or, fan in n to the 1 third, read once, linear size. Um, so that's very nice. Uh, suppose you put a gun to my head and you say, I want you to do this in depth 2 instead of depth 3. OK, I can do that. Uh, here's one thing I can do. It seems pretty naive. But I can zoom in on a depth 2 subcircuit, n of ors, n to the 1 third, n to the 1 third. I know every n of ors can be written as the or of ns, the Morgan, and I just do it. Uh, I just unfold it to an or of ns. But I, I, I pay what? I pay n to the 1 third to the power n to the 1 third, which is roughly 2 to the n to the 1 third. But I can do this. So I've done this. I do this for every single one of the subcircuits, n to the 1 third many subcircuits. I unfold it. Now I've written the circuit as an OR of OR of ANDs. And I can collapse the two layers of ORs and get a depth 2 circuit. So I, I did it. I, I, I computed depth 3 subsur in depth 2. But the size I pay is 2 to the n to the 1 third. Okay, so the natural question is, can, can you do better? And what Hustard's depth hierarchy theorem says that this construction is essentially the best possible. Uh, not just for 3 versus 2, but for 100 versus 99, and d versus d minus 1. Then you know this exponential blow up going from linear size to exponential size is, is unavoidable. OK. Good. Uh, so we have seen three results, um, three classical results. They both, they, all three of them deal with the same class of circuits. Depth d circuits, size 2 to the n to the 1 over d. OK, the, the most basic result says that these circuits cannot compute parity. Okay, we have seen two extensions of two different flavors. The first extension sh shows that these circuits cannot even approximate parity. You cannot get it correct on, say, half plus 1 over poly n, certainly not 51% of inputs. So this is one flavor of extension, average case hardness. The second flavor of extension is still back to worst case hardness, but deals with a different function. It's a much simpler function. It's simple enough to li live in depth d plus 1. But same class of circuits cannot compute it exactly. So given this picture, it's natural to ask whether you can get the best of both worlds. Uh, the same class of circuits, maybe they cannot even approximate a function in the sense of this, but a function at depth d plus 1 ac0 in the sense of this. OK? Uh, this was a conjecture by Hastad. In 86, and the main result I'd like to tell you about in this work is that we confirm this conjecture. OK, so let me state the theorem, although hopefully you can sort of guess what it says. It's going to look a lot like the, the worst case depth hierarchy theorem. 
OK, good. Uh, so our main result says that for every depth d greater than 2, there's a function fd plus 1. No surprises here. It's the Sipser function. Uh, slightly changed for technical reasons, but basically the Sipser function, such that, such that fd plus 1 is simple. It lives in d plus 1, ac0. But if you force me to use depth d, uh, just one less, even if you allow me size 2 to the n to the 1 over d, not only can I not compute it, I already know that I cannot compute it because of Hastert's result. I cannot even approximate it to 51% accuracy. The correlation is less than half plus 1 over poly n. Yes? In the arbitrary target, is the correlation? Very good. Give me one more slide. Yeah, exactly. Good. So yes, uh, so that's something to keep in mind. I don't seem to be doing as well as parity here. Uh, but OK, let me get to that in the next slide. OK, good. So I just want to say that the previous work uh, is that of O'Donnell and Wimmer, who proved the depth 2 case. So what did they show? This is a, certainly a non-trivial statement. They give a depth 3 circuit, d near size, such that any depth 2 circuit, any DNF or CNF that approximates it uh, must, must have exponential size. And I was thinking tomorrow I'll prove this in full detail. Um, we, we build on the techniques, and we, uh, we use the ideas. OK, just to answer the question that may be on your minds, I said a few slides ago that parity is extremely hard uh, for depth d AC0 circuits. Your, your correlation is exponentially small. And I don't seem to be doing as well here. So I have two reasons why I don't seem to be doing as well. One is that this is not really a very satisfactory reason. It's just not possible for the Sipser function. Okay? The Sipser function, if you recall, is monotone. And it's not hard to see that any monotone function has 1 over poly n correlation with one of a very simple circuit, xi or a constant. This is you know, KKL, or even if you don't care about the poly n, it's just a simple, simple fact. So, but this is not a good reason. You, let's try some other function in depth d plus 1 ac0. But in fact, this is not possible for any function. Uh, why is that? So by the rules of the game, what do you have to do to, con to, to, to prove a depth hierarchy theorem? Your fd plus 1 has to be simple enough to live in d plus 1 ac0. It has to be simple enough to be computed by a d plus 1 size AC0 circuit. And it's again not hard to show. This is a well known result that every poly size depth D plus 1 circuit has 1 over poly n correlation, in fact, not just with respect to the uniform distribution, but with respect to any distribution, with one of the depth D circuits that feed into it. So it seems like there's something qualitatively different about depth hierarchy theorems versus parity. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so this is like the discriminator level? Exactly. Very good question. So this, um, the picture is not entirely clear, although I can say the following. Any depth D circuit is going to have 1 over quasi-poly correlation with a depth 2 circuit of quasi-poly size. Why is that? Uh, very briefly, a depth D circuit has good Fourier concentration on the first poly log n levels. Uh, so it has 1 over quasi-poly correlation with one of the parity functions. And a parity function can be computed by depth 2 quasi-poly size. It is still possible that every, there is a poly n size depth d circuit, such that maybe every depth d, d over 2 or d minus 2 circuit of poly size has exponentially small correlation. But yeah, I, think I cannot quite rule that out yet. But yeah. it's still possible that if you care about poly size versus poly size, you can get exponentially small correlation. But if you care about poly size versus quasi poly size, um, you can only get one over quasi. So there are a few parameters here. But, and we, we know what are the limits on a few points of the curve, but I, I don't know all the points. OK. OK, good. So let me, let me talk about two applications. The first is in structural complexity. This is a pretty well-known connection, especially to this crowd, so I'm going to go quite quickly for this one. Uh, the original motivation for studying AC0 in the 1980s, as I understand it, is a connection between these circuits, what seems like very weak models of computation, uh, to you know, the polynomial hierarchy, which is a, what seems like extremely powerful models of computation. And indeed, um, you can think of the polynomial hierarchy as just, you can think of AC0 as a polynomial hierarchy scaled down. I'm not going to go into too many details, but I, I just want to say that the connection is quite straightforward, at least on hindsight. You can think of AC0 as the class of OR, N, OR, N, OR circuits, a constant, many, constant number of times. This corresponds exactly under this correspondence to the fact that the polynomial hierarchy is the class of all languages that goes for all that exists, for all that exists a constant number of times. So there's a perfect correspondence between these two. OK, good. So let me very briefly talk about the polynomial hierarchy. It's a generalization, as we all know, of you know, P and NP, which says at the 0th and 1st level, 
uh, for all integers k, just like how np generalizes p, uh, the k plus first level generalizes the kth level. And a widely believed conjecture is a strengthening of p is not equal to np, then in fact every level is distinct. So if you give me one more quantifier, I gain more power. Uh, this is stronger than p versus p not equal to np, so we are still far from proving this. But just like how if p were not equal to np with many nice consequences, uh, the same is true for this stronger assumption. Okay. So here are two statements we believe are true about the polynomial hierarchy, but we are still far from proving. The first is that the second is that pH is infinite, which I just talked about. Uh, the first is that space. It's not super important what this means if we are not clear, but just just keep in mind that the second implies the first, as is well known. Okay, so we are far from proving either of either statements unconditionally. But we can ask uh, a variant of these questions. We cannot prove it in the world we live in, but maybe we can prove it, you know, in some other world where 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 algorithms have access to a magical oracle. So can we get relativized separations proving that these two statements are true? And in fact, we have had a lot of success in tackling these questions. Uh, back in the 80s, let's focus on the first one first, the weaker statement that pH is not equal to p space. Uh, Yao and Hastert showed that pH is actually not equal to p space for some oracle A. There's a world out there for which pH is not equal to p space. Uh, this was strengthened by Tai and Babai, which showed that pH is in fact not equal to p space for almost every oracle A. Okay, so this is somewhat satisfactory evidence, at least in the ratified sense, that you know, this, this statement is true. Okay, so let's move on to the strongest statement that pH is infinite. Uh, Yao and Hassett show that pH is infinite for some oracle A. And so given this picture, uh, it seems natural to ask whether pH is infinite for almost all oracles A. If this is true, it would, you know, it would very nice, nicely gather all these results. It's a, it would imply this, of course, since you know, proving it for almost every oracle A implies it for some oracle A. And since 2 implies 1, and this implication relativizes, uh, this conjecture will also yield both of these. And as part of our work, uh, we, as part of this connection that I, I, I talked about a few slides ago, we, we confirmed this conjecture. So I just want to very briefly say that you know, this looks like it has nothing to do with circuits, uh, but thanks to this connection of first sex and SIPSA, all these are actually consequences of a circuit result. So, so pH corresponds to A is 0, and P space corresponds to... Parity, exactly, exactly, exactly. So good. Uh, so just the picture that we saw a few slides ago uh, of this you know, diamond, uh, parity versus AC0 and two different extensions, they correspond exactly um, to the fact that if you prove that parity requires you know, super quasi-polynomial sized circuits, then that shows that pH is not equal to that. And the next extension to a depth hierarchy theorem shows that pH is infinite for some oracle A. And it, again, this is sort of believable because the depth hierarchy separates depth K Boolean circuits for depth K minus one Boolean circuits. And what does it mean for the pH to be infinite? You, you believe that you know, sigma k is distinct from sigma k minus 1, which corresponds to the fact that pH is infinite for almost every oracle A. And as a consequence of co confirming this conjecture as a, as a free gift, uh, we get this conjecture in, in structural complexity. So I'm not going to say more except that you know, this is really a, quite a straightforward consequence of a very direct tr translation. But I just wanted to mention it. OK, good. So let me move on to the second application of our result, which is an entirely different area uh, in analysis of Boolean functions. Okay. okay, good. But first, let's recall a very standard and well-known fact about circuits, which is its noise stability. Okay, how, fix the function f, forget about circuits, just a Boolean function f, and consider the following random experiment. First, draw a uniform random input x, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and so on and so forth, uniform random, and pick a uniform random coordinate and flip it. If it's 1, flip it to 0. If it's 0, flip it to 1. So these are two uniform random strings that are correlated, very correlated. OK, and I can ask, uh, what's the probability that f of x differs from f of y? Uh, I can define the influence of f, also known as the average sensitivity, to be n times this quantity. Uh, don't worry too much about the factor of n. It's mostly a matter of convention. But if you allow me to multiply it by n, then this brings influence up to a number between 0 and n. Okay, and if you give me any Boolean function, you can ask me what's its influence. Is it low, is it close to zero, or is it high, is it close to n? It just seems like a very natural measure of Boolean functions. And a fundamental theorem of linear Mansour and Nissan, sharpened by Bopana, shows that AC0 circuits have low influence. If you are size s, depth d circuit, your influence is log s to the d minus one. So we should think of s as poly n and d as constant. 
corresponding to class AC0, although this extends to all SMD. Then it says that AC0 circuits have polylog N influence, which we should think of as low. In a spectrum 0 to N, polylog N is low. OK. So here's a picture of some canonical functions listed by influence. You have your low influence functions and your high influence functions. So let's start from the right. Parity is not hard to see. It's the most influent function, influential function in the world. Its influence is n. Uh, a random function is a close second. Its influence is n over 2. A majority, if you work out the math, its influence is root n. Uh, and for this talk, let's think of root n as high. Okay, so these are high influence functions. And then on the left, we have the low influence functions. And these are boring functions. You have the constant 0 function, its influence is 0. The dictator, its influence is 1. And tribes, a very simple d and f, has influence log n. And indeed, if you look at this picture, majority, a random function, and parity are canonical functions that are known not to be in AC0. And what Lina Manson Nissan says is that this is not a coincidence. That if, you know, for one setting of the parameters, if you have poly size, not just poly size, but in fact quasi poly size, constant depth circuits, then their influence lies to the left of poly log n. They have low influence. In particular, this implies a majority and a random function and parity is not in AC0, which is not a surprise because they use techniques that are used to prove circuit lower bounds to prove this result. OK, so this is a nice picture. A question that was first raised in a very influential work of Benjamini, Kalai, and Strom on, on influence and noise sensitivity, and in different forms by O'Donnell, Kalai, and Hotami, is whether a converse to linear Manson Nissan is true. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, one instantiation of this question is LMN says that constant depth circuits of polynomial size have low influence. It would be very nice if the converse were true. If you give me a function and you promise me nothing except the fact that it's low influence, say log n, it's essentially, it's close to, uh, well approximated by a constant depth circuit. It's not hard to show that it's, it cannot be exactly a constant depth circuit. That's easy to disprove. But maybe you know, every such function is 99% close to a constant depth circuit. If this were true, it would be a very nice characterization of low influence functions. You know, if you have low influence, essentially if and only if you look like a constant depth circuit. OK, so in pictures, we have that LMN says that if you're a quasi poly size constant depth circuit, you lie to the left of poly log n, you have low influence. These questions they ask if you have poly log n influence, are you well approximated by a quasi poly size constant depth circuit? Uh, so as a consequence of our result, uh, we give a strong counterexample to this, conject this question. So is there any upper bound on the circuit complexity of how you can approximate things that are low influence? Yeah, good question. Um, first of all, if you have, say, log n influence, which is a good setting of parameters to think about, then you, again, you have Fourier concentration. So you are concentrated on the first log n levels. What does that mean? You are like a sign of a low degree PTF. You can rewrite it as probably some quasi polynomial size circuit. Yeah, so there is something we can say, but just not that it's, you know, it's not an AC0 circuit. So there are variants of this question that remain interesting. You know, can you approximate every log n influence function by TC0? Yeah, in general, I think it would be very nice to give additional structural information about log n influence functions. Happy to talk about this more offline, but log n is interesting because it's exactly where Friedgott's theorem breaks down. Uh, Friedgott's theorem says that if you have influence i, then you're close to a 2 to i junta. So this is very powerful if your influence is you know, 100 or you know, square root log n. Uh, but if your influence is log n, then it just tells you that you're close to n junta, which is not much information. And indeed, you cannot get more than that if you're just working with hunters, because there are log n influence functions that depend on all var variables. So it'd be very interesting to get any sort of structural information, not through hunters, about log n influence functions. And this, this conjecture was probably you know, towards understanding that. Right, just by counting. Yeah. Yeah, are you uh, exactly because exactly exactly it's probably easy to show that yeah exactly yeah where by approximating this the counting argument wouldn't work right if you allow us you know fifty one percent approximators yeah counting argument surely just says that you know there are log n influence function that requires huge circuits to compute exactly yeah but it's I mean you can just embed a parity in a corner of the cube and that will require a large size but yeah we want yeah more robust versions. OK, so happy to, yeah. And it's, again, it's an easy consequence of our result. 
It's basically the SIPSER function scaled appropriately. OK, good. So let me actually get to our, our result. But so I, we, I've listed two applications. First is in structural complexity, confirming uh, old conjecture showing that pH is infinite relative to random oracle. And second, answering a question that's floating around. Unfortunately, there's no approximate converse, at least when we're dealing with AC0 circuits, to this beautiful theorem of linear Mansour and Nissan. So <laughs> let me get to our result, which is uh, I'd like to tell you about the proof, uh, which is the m briefly recall the method of random restrictions, which is uh, very important in the area. And difficulties in applying it in this setting to get an average case depth hierarchy theorem and how our techniques, uh, this notion of random projections, overcome these difficulties. Yeah. yeah. Didn't people notice it's a two conjecture? This is a great question. Yeah, let's talk about this offline. But yeah, you're abs absolutely right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yep. Uh, good. Anyway, so the structure of the rest of this talk is very briefly recall that something we all know, which is the structure of Hassler's theorem. How do you prove that parity requires huge AC0 circuits? I'd like to tell you why, at a high level, why extension 1 follows easily, quite easily from his technique. Uh, more interestingly, I'd like to tell you why extension 2, a depth hierarchy theorem, does not follow easily from, from this technique. So there's a contradiction, not contradiction, but there's a tension between extension 1 and extension 2. Hassler was able to prove extension 2 using a new technique, well, a variant of his technique, and, uh, but it breaks extension 1. So again, I really want to convey this tension between extension 1 and extension 2. The technique that establishes this very easily gives average case hardness. The variant that establishes the depth hierarchy theorem breaks its inherently worst case. And how our techniques of a random projection allow us to get you know, average case hardness and a depth hierarchy theorem together. OK, but let's start with you know, just quickly recalling this well-known theorem. Uh, his technique, as we all know, is that of random restrictions. At a super high level, you give me a Boolean function f. I strike it with a random restriction. What I get out is a simpler Boolean function f sub row. I'm going to make it more formal. just want to say that this, this was introduced by Subodovskaya in a slightly different context of the Morgan formulas. But it's uh, indispensable to in circuit complexity till today. Hasta uses it heavily, and we built heavily on this. So let me define what a random restriction, or just recall what a random restriction is. Here, here's one way to view a random restriction. Fix a parameter p in 0, 1. Think of p as small, 1 over log n or 0 0.1, a small parameter. And generate this string rho and 0, 1 star as follows. Independently for every coordinate, put down a star with probability p. Otherwise, flip a fair coin. So you get this string of you know, zeros and ones and stars, roughly p n many stars. And if you're not a star, roughly split half half between zeros and ones. OK, so that's a restriction. How do you apply a restriction to a function? The restriction of a Boolean function, or really just any function over the cube, by this string row is the function f sub row, where you, know, you, you take in values for the stars, and otherwise you just fill it in according to the template. So clearly, this is a simpler function. For one, it depends on pn many stars rather than pn many variables rather than n many variables. But as we'll see, sometimes you, get, you can get dramatic, much more dramatic simplification. But that's what a restriction is. Good. So again, here's the cartoon of Hastad's theorem. It says that parity, the red dot, doesn't live in AC0, the green circle. And how do you prove such a theorem? Uh, the, the proof structure was it's based on the work of first sex and Sipser, I tie. Sorry, I missed out Yale. Um, and it's as follows. You use random restrictions. Uh, f you, you strike the red dot with a random restriction. And you strike the green circle with random restriction, and you prove that two different things happen to them. If two different things happen to them, then clearly the red dot doesn't live in the green circle. Okay? In more detail, you, you hit parity with a random restriction. You prove that it remains complex. It's parity on fewer variables, but still complex in some sense. In contrast to that, if you hit any AC0 function with a random restriction, it collapses to a simple function, a so-called small depth decision tree, which lives in here. And the end game is that you show that simple functions cannot compute complex functions, that small depth decision trees cannot compute parity. OK, so that's at a very high level of structure. Very quickly, uh, number one, the first bullet is a simple exercise. Uh, just, just, it's essentially trivial. Number three is a simple exercise, that small depth decision trees cannot compute parity. Uh, the, the real work is in proving that number two holds, that you know, your green circle under random restriction collapses down to, to a decision tree. OK, so this is. Uh, Hassan's main technical ingredient, again, it was used in all these previous works, is that under a random restriction with the appropriate star probability p chosen carefully, uh, any function in the green circle, if you hit it, it collapses. Its depth goes down by at least one. 
And AC0 is a, the class of constant depth circuits. So if you just apply it a constant many amount of time, you, you, you collapse to a, a small depth decision tree. OK, good. So we just sketched at a very, very high level the proof of Hassa's theorem, showing that for depth D circuits, computing the n variable parity function, you need size 2 to the n to the 1 over D. Basically, random restrictions are able to distinguish between parity and AC0 circuits. And I claim that the proof, as I said a few slides ago, in fact, that implicitly establishes average case hardness. That not only do you prove that you know, these circuits of large size cannot compute parity, that the correlation with parity is only on a half plus exponentially small fraction of inputs. So I, I just want to point out the key property of random restrictions that, for which this follows quite easily. Um, how do we get average case hardness? A key fact is that restrictions is a simple fact, but absolutely crucial. They, they complete the uniform distribution. What do I mean by that? Roughly speaking, a random restriction, at least the way I've defined it, hides part of a uniform random string. OK, let me make that formal. Consider the following random experiment. Draw a row, as I described, independent across coordinates. Put down a star with probability p. Otherwise, flip a fair coin independently. And second, this is going to seem somewhat silly. Just fill in the stars 0, 1 uniformly at random. OK, what's the obvious fact? The obvious but crucial fact is the resulting string is uniform in 0, 1. This is clear. You know, if I do not put down the star in the first step, I flip a coin. If I do put down the star, I flip a coin. So this is essentially trivial, but this is, I believe, really at the heart of why we get average case hardness out of random restrictions. That you know, you're, you're feeding it you're implicitly by hitting a function with a random restriction, you're feeding it part of a uniform random string, if that makes any sense, which it can be completed to a uniform random string. OK. Good. So we have sketched at a very high level Hassa's theorem. We have pointed out these, this key fact about random restrictions, which we'll come back to later, showing why it easily gives average case hardness. Let's get to the interesting part about why a depth hierarchy theorem doesn't, doesn't work, at least in this overall framework. So again, here's the cartoon statement and proof of Hassad's theorem. You have parity, the red dot, and you have AC0, the green circle. You hit both of them with a random restriction. You argue that parity remains complex. It being parity on fewer variables. You argue that AC0 collapses dramatically via the switching lemma to a small depth decision tree. And then you, you argue with this a simple exercise now to show that parity cannot be computed by small depth decision trees. So this is. This is parity on an AC0. What breaks when we are trying to do a depth hierarchy theorem? Recall that in a depth hierarchy theorem, by the, by the statement of uh, the hierarchy theorem, by the rules of the game, your heart function has to live in depth D plus 1 AC0. Uh, so you, your heart function has to live here. And then at least with this random restriction, if you try to apply it with this framework, you do not get the contradiction you want. Right? The, the, the random restriction destroys your heart function, and you do not get the contradiction. OK, so this is the main, at a very high level, the conceptual difficulty in a depth hierarchy theorem. But maybe as we can all guess, it's not hard to fix it. Well, Hassel was able to fix it by, by, not, uh, by using a random restriction that's specifically designed for the Sipser function. They're now blue in color instead of yellow. And they are designed just for the Sipser function. And I'll show you how it's designed for the Sipser function. But given these clever random restrictions, you can argue that you, know, you, you hit the depth d plus first Sipser function with it. It still remains somewhat complex, enough for you to get a contradiction. And via a new switching lemma under, for these new random restrictions, you still argue that you get the same effect as you did for the switching lemma under the yellow random restrictions. Anything that's even slightly simpler than your Sipser function, in fact, incomparable, it's depth d minus 1, but exponential size. Anything that you know, has depth 1, Less, if you hit it with you know, the blue colored Sipser specific random restrictions, you collapse to a simple function. So as you can see, if you can do this, then you do get the contradiction showing that you know, depth D circuits of a certain size cannot compute the D plus first Sipser function. OK, and this is probably vague what the blue ones are, but uh, we'll, see, we'll see an instantiation of it later. OK, good. But just to recap, in fact, this, you know, I like to make the point that depth hierarchy theorem is a significantly more delicate task. Um, in a sense, in the left-hand side, your heart function is parity, which is a lot more complex than AC0 to begin with. So it's you know, at least intuitively easier to separate the power of parity versus AC0. But on the right, you're dealing with a function that you know, almost by definition has to be somewhat fragile. In depth, it has to live in depth d plus first AC0. So it takes more care to separate depth d plus first AC0 with depth d. 
And also another point is that these two are slightly different statements. Right? This, is, this is a statement showing that AC0 is a weak class, that AC0 cannot compute parity. This is not a statement about the weakness of AC0, but in fact, you know, the complexity within AC0. What this does is it slices AC0 up into infinitely many levels, such that they are all you know, much more powerful than the previous one. So these are, these are two slightly different statements, so it's not surprising that you need two different proofs. OK, good. So, but we pay a price. So recall the key fact about uh, these yellow-colored random restrictions. They're very simple. Coordinate-wise, put down a star with probability p, otherwise flip a fair coin. And, you know, and I claim that because of this property, it easily completes the uniform distribution, and you get average case hardness. On the other hand, Hasta's new restrictions for the Sipser function, as we'll see, uh, they're carefully designed with the Sipser function in mind. They're carefully designed to preserve the structure of the Sipser function. And the coordinates are carefully correlated, depending on the structure of the Sipser formula, to keep it complex. And as a result, the distribution is supported on exponentially small subset of inputs. You are not feeding it you know, a uniform part of a uniform random input, but you're feeding it you know, a specially chosen input. And hence, we only get worst case and not average case hardness. Right, so there's a slight, so the subset function itself is extremely biased, but you can make it balanced by changing the fanins. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which is what we do. Yeah. Okay, good. So let me summarize the challenge. The summary of the difficulty is, at least if you want to stay within this general framework, you need three things to establish an average case depth hierarchy theorem. The first thing is you need to design restrictions that keep your hard function, which is subset of depth d plus one complex. You, you have to keep your hard function hard. Next, you have to prove that AC0 depth D circuits, unlike your hard function, they collapse to a simple function. One and two alone will give you a depth hierarchy theorem. But if you want an average case depth hierarchy theorem, you have additional constraints on your random restriction. They have to be fair. You have to feed it you know, part of a uniform random input. The restrictions have to, have to complete to the uniform distribution. And what do we have? Hastert's usual random restrictions, coordinate-wise independent, they satisfy two thanks to you know, the powerful switching lemma. They satisfy three just because they are so simple and coordinate-wise independent, but they do not satisfy one. You know, by, by definition, you know, the usual coordinate-wise random restrictions are designed to destroy all of AC0. So you, 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 you destroy the Sipser function itself, which, which has to live in AC0. Okay, so given this, Hassett said, no problem. I'll design new ones, blue-colored, so that they're designed to satisfy one. They're designed so that the Sipser function remains complex. Via a new proof, um, he'll still prove that AC0 circuits behave the same way as they did under the yellow-colored random restrictions. So good, one and two alone will give you a depth hierarchy theorem, which is what he got. But you know, just because his coordinates are caref correlated so carefully to keep Sipser function complex, he doesn't get an average case hardness. And what we achieve in this work is that we, we achieve all three, not via restrictions, uh, but of random projections. So in my remaining time, I'll, I'll like to tell you what random projections are and sketch the proof of how we achieve all three. And tomorrow I'll go into more detail. And just to be sure, I have till 12.15? Sure. OK. OK, that's plenty of time. I OK, good. So random projections. So our technique, again, is random projections, which is really a natural generalization of random restrictions. So recall what a restriction is. Uh, here's yet another way to view it. Every variable xi, you either kill it, you set it to constant, or it survives. It, it, okay? So we can think of it as a map from xi to either 0 or 1, meaning you're killed, or you're, you remain xi, which I've denoted star in my previous slides. So that's what a restriction is. A projection is a generalization of restrictions where every xi is either set to a constant, like in a restriction, killed, or you're mapped to a new formal variable in a new space of formal variables where y, y1 to ym. OK, so one observation is that a restriction is just a special type of projection, right? where every xi, where y1 to ym are just x1 to xn. Furthermore, every xi can only be, be mapped to xi, not to xj. In particular, one thing that we really use is the fact that in a projection, you can map x1 and x5 to y1. And this is something you cannot do with a restriction. You can group variables. And we'll see that we really exploit the fact that we can group variables. OK. So as I said, uh, in our proof, as we'll see, the y variables are much smaller than the x variables. And you have collisions. Distinct x variables collide to the same y variable, depending on the structure of the Sipser formula. 
Okay. So let me actually sketch the proof of a weaker bound, 3D versus D, instead of D plus 1 versus D, uh, via a slightly simpler argument. And in fact, uh, 3D versus D separation already suffices for both our applications. OK, good. So our hard function now is in, lives in depth D, 3D. I'd like to show that it cannot be computed by depth DAC0. Good. So our render projections, like Hastad, uh, is designed with the Sipser function in mind. We have to keep the Sipser function complex. We have to keep it alive, at least. So here's the Sipser function. Uh, recall that it's a read once formula, n or n or not. Sorry, n or n or 3D many times. And suppose that the last layer is n gates. Okay, and it's read once. So the jth n gate touches you know, distinct variables from j plus first n gate. So I really could have written here x j comma 1, x j comma 2, and so on and so forth. OK, good. So this is the random projection that we'll use. And we'll see this again tomorrow. Um, it does the following. For the jth n gate, you either put down a 1 or a new variable named after the gate, yj, independently with probability 1 half, but not quite independently, a condition on not getting 1 to the w. If I get 1 to the w, I throw it away and I do it, do it again. So this is not, this is not coordinate-wise independent in particular. OK, and another thing is, this is, this is we're really using the, the expressiveness of a projection here. You cannot achieve this in a, in a restriction. OK, just very briefly, I'll go through this again in the next slide. But intuitively, why do we not want 1 to the w? We do not want, we, ha we want to keep the Sipser function alive. So you know, 1 to the w would satisfy the end gate, and who knows what happens. So I'm designing it so that my end gate doesn't get satisfied. And this is the same reason why I do not put down any zeros. If I put down just a single zero, you will falsify the end gate. And you know, I, I, I like to limit the damage to just the first level. So this is what I do. And what's the observation? If I, under such a random projection, uh, what does the jth end gate become? It's just the end of yj and yj and yj for non-zero number of yj's, which is just yj. OK. So anyway, this is, I'll say this again in the next slide. But you know, this is just how I do one stage of it. As a standard with you know, constant depth lower bounds, I just do the next time I'm going to face, be faced with you know, a layer of ors, and I'll just do zeros and zjs, where j is the name of the or gate. And again, something I want to emphasize is that we keep changing variables as we go and go. With x1 to xn, we project it. We get ones and yjs, you know, where different x's collide to the same yj. And now the next step, we project to zeros and zjs. And the next step, we project to one and you know, z prime j's. OK, but this is at least clear what we're trying to do. OK, good. So we have to argue that all three, the three things, that Sipser remains complex. Hopefully, we sort of argued it. It's by design. We have to argue that AC0 circuits collapse with simple function under this projection. And the, what's probably the most interesting is that this, this thing achieves uniform distribution. OK, so the requirement one is going to be simple because it's designed to satisfy requirement one. Right? As we sort of argued, uh, Two slides ago. Okay, I, I'm never putting down one to the w. Yes. So, so the small probability that you set the second angle to one. Yeah. Uh, so is that expected that you would get not exactly? Yeah. So I I do not allow it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I act, sorry. This no. I'm not sure if the standard notation, but I'm conditioning out one to the w. I'm not even going to worry about that. Okay, so you yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, though. In fact, to get the d versus d plus 1, I, I, I I'll need to allow this. So it's, but for 3d versus d, I'm going to be very conservative. I'm going to really try to protect the structure of my hard function. No zeros. My end gate is never satisfied, never falsified. No all one string. My end gate is never satisfied. And in particular, given this you know, conservative approach, what do we have? We have that with probability 1 under our random projection, what happens to Sipser of depth 3d? It goes to Sipser of depth 3D minus 1, the exact copy. right? It just snaps to Sipser of 3D minus 1. So this is intuitively very nice, because our hard function you know, remains very structured. You, know, you hit it once, it goes from 3D you know, to now you, know, you have end of yj, yj, yj. You can just simplify it. It's just yj, and then you get, you get your next hard function. OK, so anyway, this was designed just so that this happens, so this is not surprising. So let's go to the interesting part, um, which is that it completes the uniform distribution. So what I'm claiming here is that by feeding it this, OK, what am I claiming here? You hit, you, you throw down this string. Again, you think of your variables as grouped into blocks of w. And for every w, block of w, you either put down 1 or yj's. 
where j is the name of the block. Okay? So you get a string. The first string you get is once and y1s. The second block is once and y2s. The third block is once and y3s. And I, I'm claiming that I'm feeding the circuit a uniform random string, which doesn't make sense because it doesn't look like how is this a uniform random string. But in fact, uh, we'll see this tomorrow. The, the completely elementary but key observation, re really, I think this really helped us in this project is that this observation that a string is uniform if you bias the yj's with sufficient probability. Okay, so let, let's check this very quickly. What's the probability of getting the all one string? Well, in the first stage, you never put down the all one string. You always get some y's and at least one yj. So the second stage, you better flip the yj to, to 1, which is 2 to the, so the probability of getting the all one string is 2 to the minus w. OK, and you can check that you know, the probability of getting half ones and half zeros under this random experiment is also 2 to the minus w. Yeah, this, really, this was really key for us. Right? So on one hand, so this is a you know, crazy way of generating a uniform random string. Right? If you told me to generate a uniform random string, I'll just flip you know, a coin for every coordinate. But this says that you can you know, put down ones, group the remaining stars, and then flip a coin for the remaining stars. Why would you want to do that? Well, it seems like you would, this is exactly what you want to do in this context, where you want to preserve the hard function of SIPSER. OK, so informally, what does it say? This is not formal, that rho, which is a distribution of ones and yj's, not coordinate wise independent, composed with you know, the 2 to the minus w bias product distribution over the yj's, the resulting string is uniform random. OK, so again, not to belabor the point, but what, what are we really cr crucially using here? We're crucially using the fact that we can generate a uniform random string via the following process. Put down ones, group stars into a new variable, put down zeros, group you know, stars into you know, one more mega star, put down ones, and then keep going. And then the resulting string you get out, it's just a uniform random string. OK, and we'll see this tomorrow. But OK. Good. So I've skipped one of the two things, which I'm not going to go into detail. But roughly speaking, these two things, what do they give us? So here's the task at, at, at the start of the day. We wanted to prove that depth D, 3D Sipser formula is hard to approximate, say, to 51% you know, accuracy of 1 over polyan accuracy under the uniform distribution. I don't know how to do that. So I'm going to hit it with a random projection, which I just showed. Requirement 1 shows that you know, my hard function remains very well behaved. It just goes to 3D minus 1 Sipser formula, the same copy, no side effects. Over new variables, y1 to yj, where every, every yi corresponds to this being grouped together. And by you know, requirement 3, my task still remains you know, somewhat simple. Instead of hardness with respect to uniform, I'm proving now hardness with respect to p-biased. And just to look ahead, what you're going to do is you're going to, as you keep going and going and going, you're proving you know, p bias, 1 minus p bias, p bias, 1 minus p bias hardness as you go along. OK, so, but, okay, so this is only on the side of the hard function. Of course, we have to say something about depth D circuits. D circuits do not survive this process. Right? The SIPSER function survives this process for 3D times. We now have to argue that depth D circuits cannot possibly survive being hit 3D times with this. And I'm not going to show it, but just to recall, the, the, it's an extension of this fact uh, of Hastad's restriction switching lemma, which shows that AC0 circuits, under one of the yellow colored random restrictions, the, the depth goes down by one. Well, at least for the ones I've defined, well, we are not able to prove, and in fact, this is false, that the depth decreases by one. But if you allow me to hit it three times, I can show that it decreases by one. OK? And this is why I've only sketched a 3D versus D separation and not a D plus 1 versus D separation. And just looking ahead, what do I have to do to get D plus 1? First of all, 3D versus D is already enough for both applications. But you know, just as an independently interesting result, we, we want to get D plus 1 versus D. So to, to, to get D plus 1 versus D, we have a slightly different, significantly more delicate. You have to hit it slightly harder. Because you know, in our previous one, you're not getting the depth reduction you want after one, one, one random restriction. So it's a different random projection to ensure the depth reduction under just one 
one projection, but it, it really felt like juggling three balls, right? If you change what your projection is, you know, the two, two facts that were so simple for us, the fact, especially the fact that you know, your heart function remains complex, it doesn't remain that well behaved now. It doesn't go to depth 3D minus one, but it de doesn't go to depth D minus one, but some, you know, some sub function of it. But it's still complex enough for us to get. And completion in uniform is still the same, same observation to, to help us complete the uniform distribution. And so it really felt like juggling three balls, but finally we were able to, to get all three. So the, the summary of our approach is we design random projections, uh, orange in color, so that, so that they satisfy all three. Uh, one is that the SIPSER remains complex. Even one depth simpler, AC0 depth D, they collapse to a simple function. And also thanks to this odonno wimmer trick, you know, your string that you're feeding it in stages completes the uniform distribution. And in fact, uh, all three uh, require significant work. 3D versus D, um, you know, one and three will be very easy to establish. But you know, if you want D plus one versus D, all three require significant work. Okay, so that's actually the end of my talk. In the last slide, I just want to mention two subsequent applications of random projections. Uh, they are both, uh, crucially use this fact that in a projection you can group variables. And just want to mention them in case you know, we're, anyone's interested in talking about them. Uh, the first is in, both in you know, problems that have been studied using random restrictions. Uh, the first is in proof complexity. Uh, we give improved depth lower bounds for the Frege proof system. And here, the main two is a projection switching lemma over uh, expanders. Uh, we prove depth lower bounds for the Cyton principle on expanders. And here, what we're doing again is projecting a hard instance, which is a Cyton instance over expander, to a Cyton instance over like an expander that's hiding inside a big expander. And the previous work was based on random restrictions. And the second, which I hope to have some time to tell you about, uh, tomorrow is circuit lower bounds for so-called small distance connectivity problem, which is given a graph G undirected uh, and a parameter K is a path of length K from S to T. So this is like the parameterized version of ST connectivity. And again, here the story is that we take a hard instance of you know, ST connectivity and we project it into a, s a small instance of ST connectivity in a way that preserves its hardness and prove a switching lemma for this projection. And the previous work here, again, based on random restrictions. Okay, just to summarize, the main result here is an average case depth hierarchy theorem for Boolean circuits. It's, you can think of it as an extension of two extensions of you know, parity versus AC0. Um, we have two applications. The first is a very straightforward and well-known application of it, showing that pH is infinite relative to a random oracle. The second is a slightly different area, showing that, at least in some sense, there's no nice approximate converse to linear Manson nissan And our main technique is that of random projections, which is a uh, slight generalization of random restrictions. Thanks.